um, Reverend Kristen Causey. Can we give it up for her word yesterday? And I actually, I, I was sitting here thinking, because um, we had this conversation that we really believe that God is going to kind of bridge, bridge the gap between denominations, between uh, color, <laughs> because God is, God is all things. He's not just African American. He's not just Irish. He's, he's not just Brazilian. He's not just Nigerian. Uh, he's not just Cape Verdean or Haitian. And uh, <laughs> although we have all those nationalities in our church, um, maybe just one or two Irish. But we, we were talking yesterday that we, we just believe that God is doing something um, cross denominations, cross uh, color, and cross culture. And so without further ado, um, after you hear the speaker video, the next voice you'll hear is Reverend Kristen Causey. Let's give it up for her. Kristen Causey is an ordained minister and is the Network Women's Director for SNEMN. She and her husband, Brad, have three beautiful young children. They have been ministering in New England for over eight years and currently are taking on the adventurous calling to be church planners. Kristen believes that God wants to equip and empower women to know and be known by Him and as a result, to love and lead well. Please welcome Kristen Causey. guys can <laughs> so sweet thank you that's so fancy I don't know if I've ever had a little speaker video <laughs> thanks <laughs> um, those are my three babies and my husband so thanks for showing them I um, I miss them but I also was like hey so the snow's really bad I think I'm gonna wait just a little later and this afternoon maybe even evening I think I need to wait till the highway's like really clear and then I will be able to drive home <laughs> I was just like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay, great. So I, I, gosh, I cannot say enough how much I have enjoyed my time here. I know that you asked me to come and speak to you, but I really feel like I was blessed more, um, just immensely blessed. There have been very uh, several moments and, and words that have been spoken and worship and just so much, even God just speaking to me that he's confirming and affirming just um, prophetically, it, it's God is just doing a work in my heart, and I don't know how I'm supposed to speak right now after, <laughs> because I'm telling you, I'm like, there's like tears like streaming down my face. I'm like, to God, she's like, prophetically speaking to me in so many different ways. I couldn't even have enough time to be able to help you understand how much that was speaking to me. And so I'm like, I need to like, I, I really can I just like go gather myself, you know. Um, like hide away in a room because I don't think I can really, I don't know, but hey, you know, God is God and the Holy Spirit empowers us. So um, hopefully I can, I can make it through this, but you know, thank you again so much for like, I, and maybe you can, I don't know if you guys like post this online, but you can edit this out, but <laughs> <laughs> so I, so since I became the women's director for the, the Southern New England Ministry Network, um, I've had opportunities, the privilege to travel around southern New England and even in northern New England. I did a ministry tour last year, uh, and I've just met so many beautiful people along the way. It's been such an honor. Um, it's been intimidating and overwhelming, and it's a world that I never thought I would ever be walking into. And as, as I said, I'm, I am more of an introvert and a little more shy, and so anytime I walk into an unknown situation, I just have all of this kind of, you know, God's work in me you know, working in me to be resilient through that, but just like apprehension and uncertainty of like, what am I walking into? I mean, I don't really know anybody. I don't know. I'll just be standing in the corner because, you know, so he's working on me to like step out of my comfort zone and introduce myself and be friendly and all of that kind of stuff. 
Um, but I have to say that it is so much easier when people initiate that with me, when I'm coming into a new situation, and that has not always been the case. Sometimes you walk in and it's like awkward city. I'm sure some of you that travel around <laughs> into different ministries and stuff. Um, but I, like from the minute I have walked into your community, I have never felt so welcomed, so encouraged. <laughs> like, yes, you should be clapping for yourself because we boast in the Lord. And what God does in us, and God's doing like a really amazing thing through Jubilee Church and through your leadership and through your staff and your volunteers and your hosts. And then for all of you that are part of that community that are contributing to the community, I mean, you are amazing people. So thank you for making me feel so welcome that like even like just immediate smiles on your face. And you know what that, uh, the, the other thing that that speaks to is the joy of the Lord that is present in this community. Because I, again, I have to tell you, if you've traveled through New England, New England can be a dark place. There is, there's oppressiveness. There's uh, just a, a spirit at times of just discouragement, even in the winter months. And so as, as uh, you know, those that are following Christ, that are walking in the spirit, we're, we're combating that right and left, and so you don't often experience that just joy and the the spirit of the Lord that is just present, that energizes, and just thank you, thank you, and I know and I sense in my spirit that it is real, that it is real, and it's authentic, and I'm so thankful for you, and I'm so thankful. I told my, my husband, I was like, how's it going? I'm like, I feel like I'm home. Like, I literally feel like, like, can I get real? Okay, can I be real? Like, can I truly, it, is that okay? Okay, <laughs> okay. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I need to turn that off. Okay, I'm just going to be real for just a second. And, and I do, I do have something that God, God wants me to share. But like, I want to be real for, for cause, and I feel like Pastor Mona kind of opened this door for me to be real. Again, I can't give you all the words and I can't give you all the understanding in one moment. But I will tell you that over the last five to ten years of my life, God has been doing a deep work in me in regards to unity within the body of Christ, cross-denominationally, of course, cross-culturally, but also cross-race as well. He's been doing a deep work. I grew up in Oklahoma, white city, <laughs> Oklahoma city. <laughs> Not because it was always white around me, but because there was this just subtle racism that I just grew up always. And it was when I came out of that and I moved into New England, that I began to see it in myself. And God began to call me to repentance. And it's part of my journey over the last 12 years. It's so, it was such a small part because, again, my family, my personal family, was so loving and so open and open to all races and all people of all classes and, and all of that, but it was everywhere else around me. And we were not taught how to understand the bias that resides inside of us. And so God is doing a new thing. And so part of that new thing I believe he's doing is that he's uprooting some nasty stuff. He's uprooting and he's revealing and he's working through all of that. And I know it's dirty and I know it's messy. And I've gotten myself in some things, the things that I'm advocating for. And I am just like, I'm going. I'm going and I'm going strong. And I don't care what anybody else says around me. But I'm going, I'm going strong, because God did a deep work in me, and he began to teach me how to understand the impl implicit bias that resides inside of me. Again, not just towards other races, but other socioeconomic statuses, whether they be what I would deem as higher or lower than me. All kinds of bias, bias towards gender, stereotypes. There's so much that God is doing in that, and so I knew that I was moving in a new season of this, this, this leadership that he's called me in that I don't understand. I don't understand why he called us to plant a church other than he needs us to do a work, but who are we to do it? And I don't understand why I'm in the position of, of women director in the way that I am because I am not the typical person that would walk and step into that. It was not on my radar. It was never my desire. I said I would never be in women's ministry, and I would never church plant, and then always we know that, we know better than that, and yet here I am, but I do know that one big part of that is for me and my husband to lead the way. God gave me a vision before we started our church plant of people of all races, of all types, 
of all economic statuses, all standing together, holding hands, filling an auditorium, worshiping God our Savior, because that is eternity with him. And he is doing whatever possible, whatever possible to uproot, to clear away, and restore, restore and redeem. I brought my friend Sharissa with me. Thank you for letting me say this, because I know you don't know me totally, so it requires some trust and risk here. I brought my friend Sharissa with me. I invited several friends, but they all had, had stuff going on and everything. And so Sharissa was the only one that was going to be able to go. And even she actually was not going to be able to go. She ended up saying last minute, like, I forgot I have a trip to Florida. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, how could you? <laughs> like, how could you forget that? <laughs> I'm like, I know. How does that happen? <laughs> I think it was a little bit of a last minute thing. So I'm like, how could you? I know. I know. But she said, I, I, she's, I just know that God wants me there, so I'm going to make this work. So she rode with me, and then her husband drove four hours both ways, or all together to come get her last night. Because, again, she was like, I have to stay later. <laughs> so she flew out this morning. But she said to me, she goes, Kristen, she goes, do you think that they're going to think that you brought your black friend because you're walking into a predominantly black community? And I said, you know what? Because of the perceiving person I am and because I'm always aware of my surroundings, and again, just the way God's made me, I've thought of that. But I, at the same time, I'm trusting God. I don't know. Like, in the end, like, you, we know what we are. You know, like, we know the relationship and the friendship that we have. And at the end of the day, like, God's in control, and we're going to move in that. And as soon as, again, we walked in, she looked at me, and I looked at her. I was like, well, that's not going to be a problem. Okay. <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> we're good. And so um, some, of what is, some of what God is doing in me, God's doing in her, and there's this justice piece. And there's, there's a lot that God is doing, and we don't know exactly what God has with all of that, of, of bringing people together. But, again, when I, I received that email, I, I, she was actually sitting in my living room the same day. And I said, Sharissa, I was like, can you please, like, read this? Like, you will not believe this. And she goes, girl, I'm telling you, God's doing a thing. I said, God's doing a thing. So I don't know what that is, but I want to be a part of it. And I just, I, like, I, like you said, I, yes, I agree with that. I declare it that God is bringing us together across denomination, across race, across identity and gender, across culture. He is bringing us together, and he is tearing down all of the barriers. And I know that it's painful, and it's harmful, and it's messy, but he is raising up a generation of men and women, but women who are going to speak to the darkness, who are going to call it out into the light so that God can do his work. And so I want to be a part of that. I'm so excited about what God is doing. And the big thing is, <laughs> like, Lady LaShawn was saying, it's like, we got to go through this grinding process. This pro payment is coming. Payment's coming for our culture. I know it in the name of Jesus. Payment is coming for our culture. I know it. Payment is coming for us, but we do have to go through a grinding process. And that grinding process is part of what I feel like God gave me today. Because in that grinding process, he is forming and he is making and really, in essence, reframing our identity in him. Because you see, at the end of the day, this is what I'm learning over and over again, that that payment cannot come until we are fully 100% 100 convinced of our belonging and our identity is rooted and founded in Christ, not in our gender, not in our race, not in our roles that we fill, but it is founded when we come into relationship with Christ, our identity, the Bible says that all of that is settled first and foremost through our identity in Christ, rooted, formed, made in him, and then in the beautiful and unique ways that he has made us and designed us, it begins to get expressed through our purpose as we make a kingdom impact around us. But that identity has to be so rooted. And so for myself, I have spent the last 12 to 15, I would say even 20 years since my teenage years, where I feel like I have been in the grinding process where God is literally taking all the fragmented pieces 
of my identity, whether it be, again, based off of the role that I played in my family, my family system growing up. Do you know that both psychology and if you even look at it theologically, that generational curses are a thing, family systems are a thing, and that it can go back to generations, and it doesn't mean that we are without hope and that we are lost, but it means that we got to identify, we got to discover, we got to realize the things that we're being born out of that's in our DNA, that we're walking and in, in being born into this world. We got to, as we grow, God wants to reveal those things to us so that he can heal and he can restore and he can redeem and recon- reconcile us back to him. And so God is working, he's moving, he's forming our identity so that we can truly reclaim that purpose and that destiny and that kingdom impact that he wants us to make. I am fairly convinced that to come against our identity in Christ is one of the, if not the greatest tactic of the enemy. Because think about it. I mean, you look at our society now. You look at our culture now. It's just, it's an attack on identity in every kind of way. The enemy is feverishly coming after our identity. And yet we know that we have been given the opportunity, the invitation to be home with a father who made us, who created us, who loved us, who called us by name. He calls us to himself to come home. That's what God, some of the things that God's been showing me and teaching me over the last 10 years or so of of just exploring identity is that identity is like coming home. Our identity with Christ and God through Christ Jesus, it's like, it's like coming home. And yet in my situation, and I'm sure many of yours, home doesn't necessarily have the greatest connotation. And home was not necessarily the safest place. And home was not a place of acceptance. In fact, it was a place oftentimes of neglect or rejection. Home was a place of abandonment. Home was a place of confusion. And so the idea for me was that I'm like, come home. I I don't even know what home is supposed to be. And then when I start thinking about this idea of coming home, being at home with the Father... God, my father, then all of a sudden that starts a trail of like, well, what, what, if I don't feel safe in that concept, then what is my view of you? If I don't feel safe in coming home, then that might mean that I'm not actually feeling safe with you. And even though I was raised in a Christian home and I declared faith and trust and relationship with you and filled with the Holy Spirit, And walking and moving and growing in my relationship with you, it wasn't until my early 20s that God began to show me, Kristen, your view of me is fragmented. It's broken. It's been framed by things that you've been told or taught, lies that you've received, and you've allowed the enemy to establish these things in your mind and your heart and your spirit, and they're framing a view of me that, in fact, is not correct. So, of course, if that view is not correct and whole, then you're not going to want to come home to me. But for you to find your identity and for you to truly accept belonging in me, you've got to be willing and, and desirable and excited and encouraged and motivated to come home to me. So what am I talking about this morning? I'm talking about identity. Yes, we're talking about identity. We're talking about belonging. She read Genesis 1. It's been read actually now like, I don't know, multiple times. (laughs) God's bringing it back to mind over and over again. Genesis 1. Genesis 1. God God made man and woman in his own image. In his image, he made them. So first and foremost, we got to go back to the very basics. We got to go back to the very beginning for our identity God made you, and he made me, and he made every person in this world in his own image. And what that means is that we have immediately inherent value and worth. Don't we need to go back to the basics in our communities, in our churches, as Christians, as a culture? We all have inherent worth 
and value. And that is the way that God sees us unconditionally, that he fashioned us, he made us, and he formed us. And yet you see, if the enemy can destroy this truth and break down that truth in your heart and in your mind, if he can redirect what the voice of our Father says, that I did create you and make you, that I did see you before you were ever even a thought in your mother's mind, you were a thought and a plan in mine. He called us by name, and then he called us his. Even before his name was on our lips, Jesus died, demonstrated his love for us. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet separated, while we were yet continually resisting belonging and coming home with us, Jesus demonstrated his love for us. So if the enemy can destroy the truth of who you are and whose you are, he can destroy you and falter any impact you will ever make on the world around you. He can strip us of our freedom and erase any trust in our faithful God. And yet, you see, when we encounter Christ, everything changes. God's purposes, I said this yesterday, and I keep it in the forefront of my mind, God's purposes, God's purposes is redeeming and reconciling humanity, his beautiful creation, back to himself, back to their original purpose, back to their original design, back to their original identity. He is re recklessly, re relentlessly pursuing to redeem us back. So he gives us Christ, and when we encounter Christ, he changes our identity where it is rooted. And so God calls us to rise up, to be his hands extended, to make an impact on our world. But we're not taking hold of our kingdom purpose because our identity is so fragmented and broken. And the worst part of it all is that we are deceptive to that. We think, we claim with our words that our identity is found. Yes, my identity is founded in Christ, but we don't live like it, and we don't talk like it, and we don't think like it. And oftentimes, I don't even think we pray like it. You see, God had a destiny for Peter. And what did he tell Peter? He said, your name was Simon. I'm going to call you Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, the word, the name Simon meant like reed, like waving back and forth, flexible, unsturdy. I mean, we all know, know Peter's a hot mess, right? <laughs> I identify a lot with Peter. <laughs> Peter and me are like, I'm like, I understand you. <laughs> but then he changes his name. Jesus just changes his name, and then he turns around and he denies Christ three times in a row. And you're reading that, and you're like, what? <laughs> Why? Like, <laughs> He just changed your name, you know? He, like, he, he, he turned your story around. He gave you a new narrative, and then you go and deny him. And yet, if we really think about it, and if we're honest, that's, in essence, what we do as well, because we are humanity, and we are broken, and we are prone to wonder, right? So we're always kind of moving and, and trying to move through, again, trying to find, what is it? Our identity in him. So what is it that can keep us from that wondering? What is it that can keep us from straying? What is it that can keep us from living a fragmented life in Christ when he called us to live a whole life in Christ? I truly believe it comes back to identity. It comes back to our willingness to be home with the Father. You think about God had a destiny for Paul. I said that yesterday. Paul's name was changed from Saul to Paul. Saul was a murderer and he changes him into Paul, this person that goes and spreads the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gives us a scripture that we have today in the New Testament. God changes names. But you see, he doesn't change names to change them into perfection. You know, when we come into relationship with Christ and our identity becomes rooted in Christ, it doesn't mean all of a sudden we reach complete wholeness and we reach complete perfection because honestly, that's not possible here on this earth. And yet we can, as I mentioned yesterday, we're in a restoration process. We're in a transforming process. We have 
a story to tell. And we have a new narrative that God gives us when we come into relationship with him and he creates that belonging, that he, a new narrative that he wants to tell that's going to change lives. And so, except oftentimes, because we are not intentional in our walk of faith, we are still telling the old story. We are still living out that old narrative. And that's part of what God began to show me over the years. I'm, t- I'm telling you, years, years of loss, years of pain, years of counseling, of being able to discover where some of these things come from and why I respond the way I do to God and why I respond to people the way that I do. Just years worth, he's been doing a work. He has been grinding me. He has been pressing me. And he's been working through this process to take, just like that song said, all of the pieces. I just get so just impacted and so like just emotion floods like love and all of those things flood my heart because when that song says you picked up all the pieces and you put me back together he picked up all of my pieces of identity that my identity that was founded in being a mom and my identity that was founded in being in a broken home and my identity that was founded in being in a broken home but claimed to love Jesus and really did love Jesus but was very broken because they didn't deal with their junk my identity was found in being married. My identity was found in my temperament, which I didn't always like because I didn't like being shy. My identity was found in how I served in ministry or the way that I worshiped or the way that I looked and the clothes that I wore and the way my hair was styled. My identity, which are all these different pieces all around me, so fragmented and broken. He picked up all of those pieces and he puts them back together and he's putting them back together. Little by little, he's putting them back together when we surrender. There was a word that was given to me, a prophetic word by a friend of mine. She's coming to our conference in November. I'll give a little plug for that. It's a powerful word. I'm like, hey, I was like, I felt, you know, I'm like, I need to call her. I want to invite her to speak. One of the the many ones that's coming. And I said, you know, I don't know, like, if you're traveling or, um, you know, if, if you're doing that right now in this season, she would have been going through some transitions. And I said, but I really just feel like you, sh- you need to come and you need to be a part of this. And, and our God, I'll give you a word for our women. And I said, this, here's kind of what God has been saying to me. And our, our themes courageously rise. And again, it's this idea of like going through the grinding process. And then as we go through the grinding process, he calls us to rise, to rise up out of that, to be, to, to be a part of his kingdom here on earth, Um, but we got to rise up out of opposition, we got to rise up out of obstacles, we got to rise up out of hindrances, out of trials, so I'm sharing this with her, and she's like, okay, okay, she just launches into a sermon on the phone, (laughs) she's like, yeah, she just, I mean, she just starts talking about what God's been doing in her life, she talks, like, she's just sharing her testimony, and then she just starts speaking prophetically to me, and I'm like, okay, this was not what I thought this, you know, those times, right, where you don't, you walk into something, you're like, well, this is not what I thought this was going to be, and she, you know what she said to me, she said, Chris, and we had just met each other a year before that, too, she doesn't know me much, we only talked, like, once or twice um, before that, <laughs> that conversation, but she said, Kristen, she said, I believe God is showing you that you are rising up out of opposition, you're rising up out of your loss, out of your grief, grief, you're rising up out of all of that, but there is a girl inside of you that's going to need to die. You got to have a funeral for her, Kristen. You have a funeral for that girl, and you're going to turn around, and in a month's time, in years' time, you're going to look back, and you're not even going to recognize that girl anymore because she's going to be so far gone. And that was such a prophetic word to me because what God had been showing me was that I had this girl inside of me, that young teenage, that child, that teenager, that young adult, before I really was allowing God to work in my life. You know, I, again, faith in him, yes, yes, but not really allowing him to work deeply. He began to show me that I've been working in that girl I've been healing and restoring that girl. I've been fighting battles and winning battles for that girl. But you still turn to her when things get tough. When things are said or when things are done or when life happens. Even the change two years ago, we went through so much transition of moving and leaving our church community and starting a new one and and coming into this role. I lost most of my good friends just because of distance and time and all of those things. I lost my doctors and my counselor, you know, it's like that transition is great. It can be really good, but it's loss. 
And like he said, even in something that was so good and so celebratory, because there was loss in the midst of it, it triggered that young girl, that rejected, abandoned, detached, unsure, insecure girl. You gotta let her die. God had already been showing me that. And then to see here, this lady, this, I'm like, I barely know you. I'm like, I have to have a funeral. You guys, we have to have a funeral, okay? We have to have a funeral. When we come into an identity with Christ, we got to realize that as he begins to pick up those pieces, it's a journey, yes. It's a process, yes. And it's going to continue to eternity. But every piece that he puts back together, don't pull it back out, okay? Don't pull it back out. He's like, I put those pieces back together. And because something else happened that triggered that you're pulling it back out. And now you're sitting over here and you're holding that piece and you just keep staring at that piece. But I already put together and I need you to let it go. And I need you to go back to the wholeness that I'm creating in you. I'm making you whole. I'm making you whole. So don't go back to those pieces. So you got to let that girl you got to put a funeral. I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to that girl. You said, I loved what you did yesterday. It's like, what would you say to your 15-year-old self? What would you say to your 20-year-old self? What would you say to your 25-year-old self? I'm 35 today. What would I say to my 32-year-old self? And what would I say to my 35-year-old self in January, just a couple of months ago? Guys, just show me. You gotta, like, you, you've got to take an intentionality to let that go, because here's what happens, and this is where I want to land and really focus, that if we do not do that, if we do not, do not have an intentionality and remember our belonging and our identity in him, that it's coming home with him, the enemy comes in like a flood. And there's a thing called shame. And again, I'm becoming confident that it's one of the greatest tools of the enemy, shame. He uses shame to separate us. We see it at the very beginning. In Genesis 2, verse 25, it says, The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. They were still living in wholeness and beautiful belonging and community with the Savior. But we know that there's a shift that occurs. There's a change Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. And there's your first introduction of shame. They were naked and whole, and they felt no shame, then they begin to feel shame. And I believe from that moment on, part of the broken world we live in, part of the state of our fallen world, is shame. Shame is something that we're going to battle. Shame is something that we're going to need to work to overcome probably until eternity. But I absolutely believe that we can come to a place in our belonging and our identity with Jesus Christ where we are home with the Father, that shame no longer has a hold. Shame no longer defines us. We can respect shame. We can acknowledge that shame exists in a fallen world, but it doesn't define us anymore. That we actually, because of the power that's living inside of us that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, because we've got that power living inside of us, that we can begin to acknowledge and recognize when shame is coming in to break and fragment our identity once again, that we can call it out in the name of Jesus and say, no, I know what's going on right now. I know what's happening right now. And I'm calling it out in the name of Jesus, and I am putting it back where it belongs. There's a song that says, fear and shame can go to hell. And I said, absolutely. Fear and shame, well, I think I'm going to adopt that. Fear and shame can go to hell. And that's been one of my things that I have started saying is that when I start feeling that shame come in, I say, no, 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 no. Shame can go to hell and it can stay there because I know whose I am. I know who I belong to. And I know that he has declared me worthy and he has declared me valuable and he has declared me free and he has declared me whole. He has declared me forgiven. We see all throughout scripture 
the woman caught in adultery. The Pharisees are over on the side and they're saying, hey, 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 Jesus, look, what, what do we do with this woman? What do we do with this, this broken, messy woman? Because normally this is what we would do. We would cast a stone. But, but Jesus, what do you say we do? Jesus is, it's the scripture says, Jesus is riding in the dirt. I, I, I just kept reading that. There was a period of time where I saw him, I'm like, he's riding in the dirt. Like, what is he riding? Like, that, that's like, in, in, you know, those that study scripture, that's like, I don't know what he's writing. Nobody knows what he's writing, but w- there's a sense that it was so purposeful and so intentional that he was literally, blatantly ignoring those religious leaders. Like, I don't got time for this. I'm not concerned about this. And if you knew who I was, you wouldn't be concerned either. He just keeps riding in the dirt. And the whole time the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the spiritual leaders are over here. The most spiritual ones are saying, no, but Jesus, Jesus, what are are we supposed to do with this? What are we supposed to do with this? I see it on social media all the time. Did you know that someone posted, uh, I shouldn't even say this either, whatever. Someone posted a picture on Facebook of a screenshot of a worship leader from Hillsong Young and Free with a NASCAR shirt on, and it said Miller. And can, you, can I tell you that I saw a group of ministers and spiritual leaders and things just go after that woman because of the shirt that she was wearing. But that is what we do. That's what we do on social media. That's what we do in our conversations. And that is what we do to ourselves in our mind. And that's shame. You know, Jesus finally, because I wouldn't leave him alone, I think, finally looks up and says, you without saying cast the first stone. No. He says, he says, where? And then he turns to her. I just, I picture him coming alongside of her and putting his hand on, his, on her shoulder. Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And she said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. We use that passage oftentimes for other people. Yeah, we need to tell them to go and sin no more. And we use that passage even for ourselves. It's, God, Go and sin no, God, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Why do you keep messing up here? Why do you keep messing up there? Get it together. But you see, we're not Jesus, okay? We're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts and draws and cleans and purifies. And the Holy Spirit alone is the only one that can say, go and sin no more. So what is it occurring when we're just beating ourselves up or we're beating other people up? because of what we deem as failure or mistake. That's shame. It's not God. It's shame. Because the Bible says that, I said this yesterday, his kindness leads us to repentance. So there's going to be places in your life, in your walk with him, that as he begins to make your belonging whole and you are home with the Father, it is literally like him coming and standing alongside you, just like he did that woman. I love you. Do you see? It's harming you. It's harming your relationship with me, your belonging with me. It's harming your relationship with other people, that thing in your life, those words you say, those actions. Can you see? I want you to see because I love you, because you're worthy, because you're valuable, because I, I died for you. I made a way for you for wholeness. Can you see those things are harming you? That's his kindness leading us to repentance. That's not shame. We see also in scripture the prodigal son. It's one of my favorite stories. We spend a lot of time focusing on the prodigal son that runs away from home and squanders his inheritance and ends up with nothing and is just at rock bottom. And then he comes home, and the father welcomes him with open arms. And that is a demonstration in scripture of way Jesus welcomes us home. Home with the father, identity. But we don't spend a lot of time looking at the older son over there with his arms crossed. There's a picture by Rembrandt. If you ever think about it, go on Google and look up Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son. It's beautiful. And then there's a whole book by Henry Nouwen that's really wonderful and dissecting that painting, but helping us see into the older father, the older father that I'm convinced was full of shame. And because he was full of shame, he shamed other people. See, that's what shame does. It distorts, and then it bleeds. God began to show me that my places of shame were actually causing me to be harder on my children. 
to not deal with them in the loving discipline in the way that God would. And it wasn't so much that I was just a bad mom because I loved them deeply. It wasn't a question of my love for them. It was literally the shame that I felt inside of me that just kept going on undealt with that caused me to see them in a, a different light. And as God begins to, the more he begins to heal those places of shame and he begins to remove those places of shame and he begins to make my belonging and my home with him and my identity with him whole, free, and unconditional, I see my kids, when they make crazy mistakes or when they say things that honestly are so hurtful, right? You know, I mean, like, how could a five-year-old little girl, I don't even understand, cutest thing in the world, be so unkind sometimes, <laughs> you know, or a six-year-old boy or a 10-year-old boy that is going into, gosh, pre-adolescence or something. I'm like, <laughs> I told him one day, I said, do you know what's happening to you right now? Like, do you feel it inside? Like, do you sense your moods changing? I mean, do you see it at all? Like, is it, is it, like, do you see it? And he's like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, I'm going to help you. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to come along. I'm going to help you see, like, your moods are changing right now. And I'm going to try to, like, I don't know, help you in this. But I'm going to be with you in this. Because sometimes when those moods happen, or teenagers, I've only heard horror stories. I, rem I was a horror story. My, oh, my mouth, my attitude. But see, what happens is, whether it's our kids, whether it's our spouse, whether it's a friend, whether it's a coworker, when they come at us and we want to come back at them, that's really shame inside of us talking. It really is. Because we feel like they're confirming the things that we feel about ourselves. Or they're confirming or affirming the broken ways that exist inside of ourselves. And we see it in scripture time and time. The woman at the well. I mean, we could just go countless stories. The woman at the well. Well, Jesus comes to the woman at the well. And he says, who is your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. He says, yeah, you're right. You have five. But you see, we would look at that as being like a major problem. And I don't think that Jesus didn't think it was a major problem. He did. But he was so gentle with her. And then he introduced her to a living water that could satisfy. That in, in essence, what he did is he said, I'm going to open you up. Because you don't see it. You're not even willing to say, I don't have a husband. I know. I'm sleeping around. But I am going to gently open you up. And like I said yesterday, the tender surgeon that comes in. And I'm going to reveal where your identity is supposed to be and where it's been, but where it's supposed to be. I'm the living water that can never run dry. You've been finding that living water in men, but I'm the living water. And then she goes and tells the world. That's what Jesus does. I mean, how can we combat shame? Well, I think first we've got to discover where it comes from. And I think that's realizing that it doesn't matter who you are, you are going to battle with shame. I think these ladies that, you know, you prayed for us and like the, the older women of the faith and, you know, uh, Pastor T and Jay and, and Pastor Mona and Lasha, all of you, I'm sure, you know, we would look at you and say, wow, you know, like there's just like woman of faith. They're like heroes. But if you were honest with these women, would you say, I got shame even today that I'm dealing with? these places inside of me. Because that's the thing, is that we are not immune to shame. We see it all the way back at the beginning. I said that. We see that all the way at the back at the beginning. The role of shame and the power of shaming is introduced then, and it continues throughout generations. Continues throughout generations. Shame can come from a whole spectrum. Shame can be based off of failure and mistakes. Shame can come from those times you remember as a child of being made fun of about your clothes or your hair, being teased. I, used, I got teased a little because I didn't shave my legs, I guess, as soon as other girls were shaving their legs. Just a little bit. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal, but I felt so ashamed. by my. It was, I think I was like in fourth grade, you guys, <laughs> or third grade. I don't even know. I know, right? <laughs> I don't even know if that's a thing. I guess I'm going to have to learn that because my, my daughter's not there yet, but I'm going to have to figure that out. But anyway, I made up this whole story that I was being called Harry Monster every single day at school so that my, I could get my parents to let me shave my legs. <laughs> and now, isn't that silly? I look back at that now and I just laugh. But that was an introduction to shame. And the enemy just used, even in our innocence of not realizing what's occurring, we just like hold on to those things. Being the last one picked for a team, 
auditioning for something and not making it, applying for a job and being ignored. I mean, all, so shame can happen from our failure and our mistakes, yes, but shame also happens by messages received growing up. Shame can happen within our faith culture. I grew up in a very, very legalistic faith culture. The fact that I couldn't shave my legs and it was a thing. I grew up in a very legalistic culture. So shame was based, again, on my faith. I had to perform. I had to do it right. And honestly, as Christians, we still have a tendency. We've got pharisaical attitudes that create shame both within us and outside of us. So shame, there's a whole spectrum, spectrum of where shame can come from. And you've got to learn where it's coming from. And you learn where it's coming from by doing that deep work that we were talking about yesterday, by slowing down, by finding a counselor, by finding a good, solid, spiritually mature friend that can, and emotionally mature friend that can walk with you and help you unpackage things. You find it by getting a spiritual director, by getting a mentor, by finding a coach, by having a close companion in the journey that can say, here's the things that I'm walking through. Here's the things that I'm experiencing and unpackaging that. And you do all of that being led and guided by the Holy Spirit that cares so deeply for you that as long as you are willing to ask and as long as you are willing to take the time, he's going to reveal those places inside of you. How do we identify shame beyond starting to work through it and take the time and have people in our journey? Well, we can look at what shame says. What does shame say? What does shame say? say? Shame is the lie that says we do not have a place of belonging with Christ in the midst of our mess, that we have to get it together, that it has to look a little better or a little cleaner or a little nicer if we're going to actually belong to Christ. Shame is what causes us to tell other people or somehow display to other people because we refuse to get real and refuse to get authentic with people that when they look at us, they think we have it all together. And so somehow that has given the inadvertent message that I've got to get my life together because if I'm going to be with God the way they're with God, then I've got to get it all together. And yet the fact of the matter is, is that none of us really have it all together. Shame tells us that Christ does not welcome us until this is taken care of or until that is taken care of. Shame causes us to run away when all we feel is darkness because it's afraid of the light. I think sometimes, Pastor LaShawn, that the reason we want to drop that fruit, that olive off, is because the darkness is so great and it doesn't feel good, and we can't really truly see who Christ is, and we can't really truly see what he's doing, and we're kind of scared that he's actually not doing anything because maybe he doesn't love us enough to work hard for us because maybe we're not deserving of love, and so we try to short-circuit that process and try to make it work for ourselves. Shame is the inner critic that shouts at us that we will never measure up. I'm not enough. I can't do enough. This will never be enough. I will never learn enough. I will never figure this out. Shame says there is something inherently wrong with me. Shame is an exposure to the core raw places that may reveal who we fear we truly are. Shame drowns out belonging. It sends us into the wilderness. It gets us spinning in circles and forgetting who Christ is and what he offers. Shame is what causes me to ignore that God is with me at all times and in every moment. Shame reframes belonging and creates a transactional relationship that I feel I can never fulfill. And then ultimately, one of the enemy's greatest desires is that shame sends us into hiding. Hiding from God and hiding from others and even hiding from ourselves. This is not an easy topic. I'm just waiting a moment here because, you know, I just, it's, I, I'm sorry, it's just not one of those things that you can sit in this moment and write those notes down and go, okay, mm, yes, let's keep moving on. Mm, shame is some of our deepest 
places of brokenness. Shame is our greatest darkness. Shame occurs because when we are in that grinding process, one of the things that the Holy Spirit is doing is he's revealing those places inside of us that do need to have repentance. Those ways that we act or those ways we relate to other people, whatever that may look like, harm, that's present. So as we go through that grinding process and we're in that dark place, and the Holy Spirit just keeps showing us these things. God's fighting for us. And he's like, I know this hurts. And I know this is painful. And I know this is dark. But if you let me work with you, if you let me examine your heart, then I can heal your heart. But see what's happening the reason sometimes we just get up, I talked about it like being like on a table and a surgeon just tenderly working. Sometimes when we just push it aside and say, I can't deal with that anymore, and I start to do my own thing. And I will even do my own thing in the name of Jesus. But I start to do my own thing. It's shame. Shame saying, see, look at, look at what's inside of you what you came from. Do you really think that it's possible? I know that God has called me to speak his word. I, I don't know why he puts the, his hand on us the way he does. I know that God has called me to write. I'm a writer. It took me a long time to be willing to say that. I know that God has called me to be the best wife and mom I could ever be. But as God begins to reveal things in my life, as I let him and I see those ways that I've maybe hurt my kids in something I said or I, what, I stayed detached for them because I just felt like in a moment they just needed too much for me and I couldn't give them what they needed. As I begin to take inventory, that doesn't feel good. And it's shame that says, see, this is, you can't do this. You can't preach his word and have these battles at home. You put what you want on social media, but I know exactly what's happening behind closed doors. You stand and you worship God all you want, but I know what's happening behind closed doors. I know what's happening within that mind. And so often, we mistake that voice for the Holy Spirit, the Son of God, our righteous Redeemer, our victorious King, our loving Father. He so desperately wants to deconstruct those places of shame so that he can replace them with the truth of who he is because his kindness leads us to repentance because he realizes he's so good and he is so powerful that he knows that if you just have a little bit of time with him in a way that is whole, that's like being at home, you're going to walk out of that room and say, oh gosh, I'm going to work on this stuff because it's the work of Christ inside of you that's making you whole and motivating you to do and to be and to live in all the ways that he called you. But he's got to do that work. And I think that's the message that he just keeps saying through all of us this weekend is that he, there's a work, there's a process. And can I tell you, that grinding process isn't all hard the goodness of God is that he gives us opportunities, he gives us families, he gives us relationships, he gives us great jobs, he gives us beautiful things, he gives us fun times and, and, and enjoyable times and vacations and, and all of these beautiful things, even in the midst of the grinding process, because he knows that, he, he knows that 
We need those things. We don't need them more than we need him, but he just knows, and he loves us that much. The Bible says that he's a good father, that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, and he delights in giving gifts to his children. So while he's working in you, don't let shame confuse you and think that he's mad at you or that he's just this disciplinarian that's coming in to try to fix you. No, 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 no. It's in his love that he disciplines. And so all the while, he, there are good things that are happening, and then there are seasons where it is completely dark and you can't really see any good. But the thing is, is that it's not constant. It eb ebbs and flows, and we're doing it with him. We're not alone in it. I'm not exactly sure how you know, we should close, Pastor Mona, because I, I would love to give them a moment just to be with God, you know, like search their heart. But my final reminder is that, let me see if I can find the scripture so I don't have to try to say it from memory. Ephesians 1, verses 4 through 8, I've got a couple scriptures here. Let this be, it's God's word. It's speaking directly into your heart. Ephesians 1, verses 4, we read that even before the world was created, God loved us and he chose us. Hebrews 4 says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Ephesians 2, 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have I not commanded you, be strong and be courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. And then this final prayer. This is something that I took from Psalm 103, and I just wrote. It was a declaration of prayer and praise for myself that I would go back to in these times of, like, where shame just was, like, there. From the beginning to the end, the one who came down to shatter darkness, because he was, because he is, because he is to come, never ending, I will praise him. Not fragmented praise, but wholehearted praise that wells up within the depths of my being, that wells up not just from the good places and good things, but from my darkest place, praise that wells up from the deepest pit and the ugliest sin. Sometimes we have to talk to our souls, slow down, reflect, and remember his goodness and worth. Soul, I will bless the Lord at all times and never forget the benefit of knowing my Jesus. Soul, you have been broken and abused. You have been confused and doubted. You have known sorrow and uncertainty, but soul, we are going to praise his holy name. Soul, with my whole heart, I'm going to remember the good things that my God has done. So God, I'm reminding my soul you have redeemed me, forgiven me, and healed me. You are ever restoring me. You have filled my life with good things. You have shown me mercy and unending grace. You have caused justice to shine upon me. And when my soul is fragmented and torn, you do not push me away in harsh anger. No, you draw me in and tenderly make known to me your unfailing love. So soul, let's praise him. We got to talk to our souls sometime. Amen. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the way that you empower us. God, I thank you for the way that you change us and restore us. But most of all, God, I thank you for your unfailing, unconditional, incomprehensible love. God, I pray for these women that throughout this weekend and as they continue in their journey with you, that you would reveal those places inside of them that break and fragment their identity. And then I pray in your kindness and com your compassion and your love that you would continue to make them whole as they trust in you. Amen.